Let me talk to your mother. You can't. Why not? She's next door petting Ted. She's what? Tis the season for family, friends, gifts, cookies, or if you're on this video, for remembering some of the most beloved Christmas movies out there and just how dirty they could be. I'm Keefe Nosi with Wicked Binge, and this is Christmas movie adult jokes. Nicest to naughtiest. Ooh. Christmas, everyone. We're gonna start things off old school, like 1940s old school. Our first movie of the day is Miracle on 34th Street. We've been spelling it wrong. Not only does this screenshot reveal that Santa's next of kin are his reindeer, not gonna think too hard about that, one of their names is Donder. No, not Donner, like we've been calling him since we first heard the Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer song. It's Donder. Makes you feel like a real Donder head, doesn't it? A little too much Christmas cheer. And of course, we can't ignore the infamous scene of Mrs. Shellhammer being, true to her name, absolutely shell-hammered when answering a phone call in the bathtub. <laughs> Hello? This woman downed nine triple strength martinis. And let's be real, she probably wasn't even done there. Neither are we though. There are plenty more Christmas stories to discuss, starting with a Christmas story. A different time altogether. Ralphie's strive for a BB gun is something fewer kids today would relate to, and his fantasy about killing several eccentric robbers might be considered a little concerning today. Though in our opinion, Ralphie was just exercising his God-given right to defend his home with official Red Rider, carbine action 200 shot range model air rifle with a compass in the stock, and this thing that tells time. Though the fa ra 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 song from the Chinese restaurant may have aged pretty poorly. And we all knew this one was coming. No discussion of sleazy Christmas movie jokes is complete without the classic Christmas story leg lamp. A lamp! The already racy design is made even dirtier when you realize that reaching to turn it on looks like reaching up a lady's skirt. Come on, at least buy her a drink first. Wait, actually, don't. Don't do that. Do not pour a drink on the lamp. Now we move from a classic Christmas tale to a retelling of one. Next up is Scrooged. Carol Kane brings the Carol Payne. The most infamous aspect of this movie is the Ghost of Christmas Present, a fairy godmother-esque character who delights in both giving and receiving pain. Wow. No, thank no, you're not the only one who thinks that sounds kind of kinky. Not sure that's what they mean by the season of giving, but whatever. You know, I like the rough stuff, don't you think? But now it's the season of giving. Your family an absolutely nightmarish Christmas vacation in National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Clark Griswold is an awful, albeit hilarious, person. Really, the dirtiest aspect of this movie is the main character, Clark Griswold, being absolutely awful. It's good, it's good. <laughs> This isn't an uncommon trope, mind you, plenty of beloved characters are made to be horrible people so you can laugh at their misfortunes, but Clark's on a whole new level. For instance, a dirty mirage. While looking at his neighbor's Christmas pool party, Clark finds himself in a fantasy about a very attractive woman, despite having a wife. Honestly though, still pretty tame compared to the whole chainsaw thing. He almost made his family disappear, like Kevin did in Home Alone. One, two, ten. One of the most famous jokes in this movie is watching a movie he's not quite old enough for, Angels with Filthy Souls, a mobster movie with a brutal machine gun murder scene. One, two, ten. It's a wonder how the poor, terrified pizza guy didn't call the police when he heard those gunshots. Good thing it was just the movie. Nero's Pizza, no fiddling around. Aside from Nero's Pizza being a possible reference to the popular Little Caesars chain we all know and love, mmm, hot and ready. With both being named after Roman emperors, the tagline, no fiddling around, is a cheeky nod to the phrase, Nero fiddles while Rome burns. The saying refers to his minimal concern for his people's plight and long whispered rumor that he played the violin as the city burned. I made my innocence disappear. With the family out of the house, Kevin takes advantage of his freedom in part by checking out his older brother's stuff. One such forbidden treasure being a Playboy magazine. Really, Buzz? Right next to the picture of your girlfriend? Woof. <laughs> but thankfully, the parents learned their lesson. Never forgot Kevin again, and I'm just kidding. Here's Home Alone 2. Uncle Frank needs some kind of therapy. Telling your nephew not to record you singing in a shower is totally valid, but saying he'd never feel like a real man if he saw him naked, implying he's got a big... <laughs> he says if I walked in there and saw him naked, I'd grow up never feeling like a real man. Uh, anyway, is the furthest thing from an appropriate lesson for a child, is what I'm trying to say. Angels with even filthier souls. The mobster movie joke from the first film was such a hit that decided to reprise it with even more iconic lines. You've been spoken with everybody. Snuffy. L, Leo, Little Mo. Oh, did we forget to mention those movies aren't actually real outside of the Home Alone universe? Shame, really. 
If you're more of a Halloween fan than a Christmas one like me, you're in luck. Next is The Nightmare Before Christmas. What happens in Boogie's Lair? Casinos are often referenced in kid-friendly media, but having a villain like Oogie Boogie who's centered around themes of gambling is something pretty unique. In one scene, he even hits the ground to change one of his dice rolls to a more favorable number. <laughs> Looks like I won the jackpot! The literally two-faced mayor of Halloween Town. But what's scarier than ghosts, skeletons, and gambling burlap sack dudes? Politicians! With the mayor of Halloween Town having literally two different faces, it's a cheeky nod to the two-faced politician stereotype that's unfortunately proven to be pretty accurate over the years. Next! Now for what's perhaps the most on-the-nose name for a Christmas movie out there, the Santa Claus. From Woodstock to Woodstockings, Scott discovers that being Santa requires a little bit of floating, an activity he's thankfully used to already thanks to his fond memories of the 60s. It's okay, I'm used to it. I lived through the 60s. When hippie culture reigned supreme for the youth and the air was filled with peace, love, and some kind of smoke, X-rated bedtime stories. When his son is called into a parent-teacher conference about his belief that his old man is Santa, Scott plays along with his childishly risque account of their time together. He playfully suggests that the book they read was Hollywood Wives, an infamous work that should be nowhere near a child. What book? Uh, Hollywood Wives. 1-800-SPANK-ME. Apparently, Scott's had some interesting phone calls over the years. 1-800-SPANK-ME. I know that number. Which is almost certainly a phone sex hotline. Either that or some kind of weird corporal punishment service. Which is honestly even worse, so we're actually hoping he's doing the phone sex thing. Poor Scott, man. But you know what? He's earned that weird phone call given what he's been through in his divorce. He bitterly vents to Bernard the Elf about how his wife had a much better attorney than he did in the divorce procedures. Let's not open up that wound. Even Santa can't escape the US legal system's naughty list. Toy collectors, this one's for you. Next up is Jingle All The Way. Want me to go check? One of the most hilarious scenes of this movie is Howard's phone call with Ted, in which this absolute madman asks if Howard wants him to check on his wife. I think she's in the shower, Howard. Do you want me to go check? No! Honorable mention to his absolutely ecstatic moan upon biting into one of her cookies. I mean, I'm here and... Mm, oh, these cookies! Which, we're sure Howard did not find as funny as we did. Oh, and it gets worse. Later, when Howard demands Jamie to let him speak with his mother, he remarks that he can't because... She's next door, Pet and Ted. She's what? The poor man just wanted to buy his kid a toy, and now his wife's cookies are being pet by the neighbors. If the next star of this list went through that, his hatred of Christmas would absolutely make sense. Next is How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Mind if I wet my whistle? In one scene, the Grinch steals a bottle of liquid from an old man and chugs it. Mind if I wet my whistle? Well, uh... If the three X's on the bottle aren't obvious enough, the fact that it's flammable enough to give him dragon breath for a moment indicates that he was probably going to have a headache in the morning. And a lofty ticket, if the subsequent toy car drunk driving is anything to go off of. Martha May. The Grinch grew up having a massive crush on a girl named Martha May, and it seems the feeling was mutual. Did I have a crush on the Grinch? <laughs> well, of course not. When he touches her in one scene, she straight up shudders in delight. And let's not forget that he's launched face first into her boobs in another scene. But my heart belongs to someone else. Hmm? It's really not easy being green. When a taxi driver refuses to pick up the Grinch, he sadly accuses him of racism. That's because I'm green, isn't it? This is one of the more common jokes about racial discrimination in media, and even the Grinch is questioning just how funny it really is. Christmas cheer, but not the wholesome kind. In one scene, the Grinch's new parents host a party in Whoville and drop their keys into what appears to be a swinger's bowl. This is a reference to what's called a key party, in which participants draw random keys from a bowl to determine which couples will be, um, unlocking each other's doors. You know, honking each other's horns. Oh, so that's how it works. Gotta get that promotion somehow. In the same scene, one baby's arrival at another home implies some less than savory swinging. He looks just like your boss. Hey, at least you know where the pay raise came from, right? <laughs> yeah, I'll get the divorce papers. Santa and his claws players have got enough exposure for now. It's time for Elf to step into the limelight. Watch it, buddy. Literally. Buddy hears Jovi singing in the shower and decides it's perfectly normal to just chill in the bathroom singing a duet with her. Honestly though, creepiness aside, they do sound kind of good together. Buddy's interesting gift tastes. You'd think that an elf would know a bit more about gift giving than the average guy, but when Buddy wants to get his dad something special, the store's advertisements naturally draw him to the lingerie aisle. What's that? Look, we all make mistakes, Buddy. Please, just leave the lingerie aisle. Action! 
about Miles Finch. Miles Finch. When Buddy gets into a confrontation with Miles Finch after confusing him for one of Santa's elves, I didn't know you had elves working here. He makes sure to let Buddy know he gets more action in a week than Buddy will get in his entire life. Jackweed, I get more action in a week than you've had your entire life. It's finally time to return to the world of animated Christmas movies for the one I legitimately thought was live action as a little kid, the Polar Express. The train is powered by flux capacitors. Neat, right? The Polar Express is powered by flux capacitors, a reference to the classic movie Back to the Future, and uh... Flux Capacitor. Huh, that's uh, that's it for this movie. If only there were a more raunchy animated Christmas movie out there. Well, thankfully we've got you covered. Enough of those beloved family classics. It's time for a Walgreens bargain bin train wreck you've likely never even heard of. That's right, I'm talking about the legendary work of art known as Elf Bowling. For those blissfully unaware, this movie is absolutely bizarre in everything from its concept to its execution to its shockingly A-list voice cast that got Tom Kenny to play Dingle, Santa's evil pirate brother, and trust me, yeah, it gets weirder. For a kid's movie, there's a lot of cleavage. Most notably when Dingle is on his way to Fiji with the elves, he meets a woman named Veronica who successfully and very easily seduces him into becoming business partners with her. <laughs> Oh, yeah, and that's not the only innuendo. In one scene, Santa instantly falls in love with his soon-to-be Mrs. Claus after smelling the delicious strudel she made for him. Rather you keep your hot strudel in your pants. Yes, he, he worded it like that. But for all its faults, this movie might just have the greatest villain song in film history. If this movie did nothing else for society, it successfully convinced SpongeBob and the Ice King's voice actor to sing a song about the benefits of slavery from a business standpoint. Slavery makes the world go round, it's easy enough to see. Uncle Ruckus would be proud. All right, we hope you got a laugh out of that one. Now let's go to an actually acclaimed Christmas animation, Arthur Christmas. Reference to VJ Day Kiss. In 1945 in Times Square, when World War II had officially ended, a sailor gleefully grabbed a nearby lady and kissed her. A kiss that's gone down as one of the most iconic images in American history and one that's been referenced in countless media. This movie is no exception. Two elves celebrate the same way after another successful Christmas Eve. Gay elf representation. To the naked eye, Peter the Elf's devotion to Steve might just look like a typical corporate suck up trying to get a promotion or two, but there are signs that his feelings run much deeper. From his constant still up texts to the fact that he used a power outage as an opportunity to grab Steve's hand. Peter, let go of my hand, please. Grand Santa's possible alcohol problem. This one might seem mean. After all, just because Grand Santa is an old man who misses the good old days doesn't mean that he's an alcoholic, right? Oh, Merry Christmas, everyone! But, like, I mean, there's a literal cart of booze next to his recliner. There's not a lot of wiggle room there. Dog and Slipper, a forbidden love story. Let's not forget the scene where Arthur discovers the hard way that dogs seem to like his slippers more than him. Any pet owner knows how dogs tend to treat their master's objects when they're in the mood. Happy Christmas. But in his defense, they are really cool slippers. Let's take a quick detour to Disney Plus's Noel. Santa's simple mistake. On his first Christmas Eve delivering presents, Santa accidentally drops into a household that happens to have a menorah and no Christmas decorations. Which you wish. Leading to what's likely a family of very confused people who just witnessed a large man fall into their fireplace. And for our grand finale, we'll take a look at Spirited, which holds one of the most memorable and relevant jokes in modern Christmas media. The three pillars of unsavory people. This film centers around literal Christmas spirits guiding the most unsavory people on the planet to redemption, like Scrooge in A Christmas Carol. When Clint Briggs is shocked that he's chosen for the program, the spirit reassures him that he's faced plenty of racists, murderers, and, brace yourselves, people who do gender reveal parties. 